Julie Bombastino with Real Food Lens. I'm the founder and CEO, um, presenting today on real food nutrition for people on feeding tubes. And I'm joined by Bridget McDonald um, from Rec Girl. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and explain how you're involved with Rec Girl, Bridget? Sure. Thanks so much, Julie. My name is Bridget. I am the coordinator for RecGirl.org, um, which is a subsidiary of Girl Power to Cure. Um, RecGirl.org is our family support network. Um, so we have our, our website and we have um, our Facebook page and, and different entities that, um, that help support families that are um, dealing with Rett syndrome. Um, and Rett University is our educational subsidiary. So um, this webinar will be housed at Rett University and, um, and made available for parents. So we're so excited um, that Julie's here with us today to give us all this wonder wonderful information on blended diets. Thanks so much, Julie. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here, and I'll do a quick introduction of, of myself. I um, I am a mom of a kid on a feeding tube. That is my big qualification here. I'm not a doctor or a dietitian or a nurse. This is not medical advice by any means. I just want to share with you kind of our story and then um, a little bit of background. You know, we've been, um, my son AJ, you can see him there. He's much smaller. He's been on a feeding tube since he was six months old and he's uh, he's five and a half now. So almost five years of, of being a feeding tube mob, I feel like it does qualify me for something. <laughs> um, and, and that's AJ. We call him our chief inspiration officer. Um, and here you can see him. So AJ was put onto a feeding tube back in 2011 um, due to aspiration. So we suspected that he was um, aspirating, so getting liquid and fluid into his lungs um, after seizures. And so the picture here of him as a baby is the last one my husband took before he went in and got his G2 placed. You can see the NG is the tube going down his nose where he was getting nutrition from for a couple days there. And then on the right you can see um, that's a picture of my daughter and, and AJ last Halloween, so about five months ago or six months ago at this point when he was almost five. Um, he's a little Superman growing like a weed, but those are fake muscles, I should say. Um, so that's really the inspiration for where Real, where Real Food Blends came from. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Real Food Blends in a little bit, but first we're going to get into some of the basics of uh, G-tube feedings um, and what G-tubes are. So you know, before before AJ, before I had a son on a feeding tube, I never knew or even really gave two thoughts to what a feeding tube was or why people got it or really what went into it. But, um, you know, obviously life changes when it's somebody that you care about and that you're taking care of or yourself even. So G-tubes are surgically placed due to a variety of reasons. Uh, it can be neurological, like my son AJ. So, you know, the act of swallowing is, um, is controlled by the brain, controlled by your neurological system. And if that's not working correctly, it can be dangerous. So um, you can aspirate, so get food into your lungs, which can ultimately to lead to pneumonia, which can ultimately be deadly. Um, so that's always wanting to be avoided. So in many cases, though, with children especially, um, oral feedings are fostered in addition to G-tube feedings. Um, this can be very important because you want to keep the mouth working um, and keep the swallowing mechanism working correctly, uh, but only if it's safe. And so you may hear of um, people talking about being NPO, and that means that they're not safe to have anything by mouth. Um, my son AJ was NPO for uh, quite a few months and then once we did get cleared for oral feedings he had an oral aversion so he refuses to take anything now but um, luckily he's got a tube and so he is very well nourished. So. And then historically, after the G-tube is surgically placed, the child would be, pres be prescribed a formula diet through the feeding tube. Um, and usually the dietitians at the hospital will kind of help you with that and make a recommendation on, on, on the formula and how often and all of that. So the G-tube is placed directly into the stomach. Um, it, it goes, you know, it's similar to the esophagus. Basically, it's just a different tube <laughs> into the stomach. So here we want to take a look at uh, what exactly is in the formula that you would be prescribed if you were on a feeding tube or your child would be. So it's really interesting, and I think more and more people in this day and age are reading labels um, and reading ingredient lists, and the same thing is happening in the intro world, and intro is just a fancy term for feeding tube. <laughs> uh, it's what the medical professionals refer, refer to this, so you might hear about intro nutrition. Um, so what is actually is in these formulas? You know, you can read the ingredient list here of these two popular ones, and water, corn, maltodextrin, 
dextrin, which is a corn syrup derivative, sugar, milk protein concentrate, soy oil, soy protein isolate. So, you know, things that maybe you wouldn't choose to eat, things that maybe you don't have in your kitchen. Um, and, and the rest of, of those ingredients there is basically a multivitamin. Um, and, and a similar list is down below on the uh, the other formula there. So wa water, corn maltodextrin again, calcium, potassium, caseinate from milk, sugar. Um, and so things that, you know, again, it's not inherently bad by any means. This isn't, um, you know, we're not trying to vilify formula. It's kept a lot of people alive for quite some time. Um, but as people are living longer and longer on feeding tubes, and we are understanding more and more about nutrition and what we do get from, you know, fruits and vegetables and lean proteins and healthy fats, um, you know, we're kind of thinking, okay, do I need to put this? Does it have to be just formula in my uh, in my feeding tube? And the answer, you know, nowadays is, is no, it doesn't. So. Um, Talk a little bit about complications from G tube feedings, and unfortunately, these are these are pretty inevitable. Um, anybody who's living on a feeding tube for any period of time most likely start dealing with one of these issues. Um, so the feedings can the complications can be anything from gagging and retching, which is basically trying to throw up, um, GERD, so severe reflux uh, happens. You know, almost all the time with um, a 100% formula diet, abdominal pain, feeding refusal, um, all of these things are pretty common. Um, you know, we don't have on here, which is one thing that's incredibly common, is is either diarrhea or constipation, um, and, and unfortunately, many people have to deal with one, and then the next day it's the other. Um, so, very common complications with G2 feeding. So, these symptoms can affect um, a child's willingness to accept oral feedings. So, if that is the ultimate goal, is to be um, you know, fed orally or to keep that, that feeding mechanism going, it, it can, you know, really hinder that, so lead to an, or, an oral aversion. And the complications can lead to G-tubes, Nissen's, and additional medicines um, and surgeries. So the symptoms of formula intolerance, you can see these two things are kind of similar. Um, you know, it, most folks that have complications with their G-tubes, they're actually having complications with their formula, not um, not just the tube itself, especially, you know, once the, the incision has healed and all of that. So the gagging, retching, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal distension, um, so bloating, cramping or dumping syndrome, and then lack of weight gain slash weight loss, kind of all very common when you're talking about a formula-only diet. So and what does this mean for a quality of life? Um, so the persistent symptoms can affect both the family and the ch both the child and the family's quality of life. Um, oftentimes the family will feel tied to the feeding tube. So if you're talking about a child, you know, if they're on a feeding tube and they're, um, you know, having all of these issues, maybe you slow down the feeds. And so it's taking two hours to get in eight ounces of formula. And well, you know, two hours later it's time to start lunch, and then two hours later after that it's time to start dinner, and it really can feel tied to the feeding tube. Um, so it Restricting travel outside of the house or movement around the house is very common. Um, I remember when my son was on, you know, formula only at first, we were like, just don't touch him. Put him in a side chair, hook him up, and don't touch him. Don't get him excited. Don't make him laugh. Don't make him cry because he would throw up. Um, and limiting the ability to carry on daily tasks, so school, work, and other activities. Um, and then finally here, the dependence on medications for motility, reflux, or acid suppression. You know, unfortunately, most of our children are on, um, you know, medications for, uh, you know, all of their you know issues that they may have, and so adding you know more medications on top of um, what they have, you know either for reflux or for diarrhea or constipation, is just one more thing that has to be um, done every day. And then one thing that you don't hear talked about a lot in the medical community are the psychological impacts. Um, I know as a mom of a tube-fed child, you know, when AJ, you know, I was actually nursing him up until the point that he got placed under the feeding tube, and it was um, really psychologically devastating for me as a mother to not be able to, you know, cuddle him and hold him and give him a bottle or give him um, or nurse him and, and instead just put him in his chair and hook him up to this thing. It was a very medical process. And so um, the caregivers, you know, especially the, the parents can miss out on important bond bonding rituals related to meal times and if if the child's a little older they can be they can feel excluded from family meal times the cooking and the social aspects of eating real food which um, we don't want to do <laughs> by any means you know our um, our relationship with food in in this country and pretty much all over the world is is social and it's um, you know it is a bonding experience and that often changes and does have an impact on the quality of life when you've got um, a feeding tube 
So we're going to talk about blenderized diets. So blenderized diets are really um, kind of what it says. It's just blending up real food and putting that through the feeding tube. Um, sounds pretty simple. There's a lot of issues around it. There's a lot of um, meanings and potential and some very heated arguments at times about this. So really, it's just blending up real food and pushing it through the feeding tube instead of traditional formula. Um, it's that simple, but again, can come with some with some heated issues. So. Um, why real food? So, you know, if we weren't talking about somebody having a feeding tube and you just said to somebody who's an oral eater, why are you choosing real food instead of processed food? You know, they might look at you like you have four heads. But when it comes to feeding tubes, we just have, um, the medical community has just, for the better part of 40 years, thought um, feeding tube means formula. So why real food? Well, first you can take a look at this kind of before and after of Jacob, who um, his mom Karen shared this pictures, these pictures with me quite a few years ago. Um, you know, on the left there, he was 100% formula fed, and the next year, you know, same school picture, same, um, same kind of everything, same background, same time of year, and look at what a difference that made in his coloring and his eye contact, and just, um, he looks like a half, healthier, happier kid, um, and that was one year on a homemade blended diet. So pretty amazing kind of before and after there. So, But why real food for people on feeding tubes? So improvement in reflux and, and GERD, improved color. You can see that with Jacob for sure. I mean, you go, you know, just live off of eight cans of formula a day and see what, you know, how your skin tone looks. Um, there can be an increased interest in oral eating. There's improved volume tolerance. So what that means is that, um, you know, we often hear that people on a feeding tube can only take, you know, maybe six or eight ounces of formula at a time. And so they have to be fed every two or three hours because they can't handle any more than that, um, which really is a small amount. I mean, if you think of a five-year-old child having a regular lunch, they often would have eight ounces of, of milk with that. So it's really a formula issue, not just a, um, a volume issue. And so that can, that's one of the biggest things that we see with real food is when they, you know, they can take more real food at a time, which frees them up. And to do other things, not tied to that feeding tube so much. Um, improvement in bowel habits, so the diarrhea and constipation can be resolved, and the feeling of normalcy. So that kind of talks again to this um, element, the psychological element of having real food and being included in mealtimes. Um, and you know, lastly here, what are the benefits of anyone being on an all-natural whole food diet versus processed foods? So. Um, you know, is this to a certain extent is common sense, but it does, you know, it's different when we're talking feeding tubes for sure. Um, and, I, you know, all of these things have been proven out by a couple of, um, handful of studies that have been done really over the last couple of years um, with children on feeding tubes. Um, more are being done, which is great. The more clinical evidence we can have, the better. So why don't medical professionals, um, you know, routinely promote blenderized diets? So homemade blending, uh, uh, making all this food, and I, I kind of love this picture there. I don't know where exactly that came from, but um, look at all that blending and all that work and all that cooking. And it's often the family is involved, but that is a lot of work. And when you're caring for a medically fragile loved one, it's not always possible. So um, medical professionals concerns about homemade blending, uh, they are concerned about the risk of contamination. So um, they don't know how sanitary things are. They don't know that it's not, you know, old food, you know, there's, there's, you know, some, some say that's a, a valid concern, some say it's not as long as you're using good kitchen practices, but there, it is, you know, a medical professional concern. Um, the risk of clogging the tube, which can be a valid concern if you don't have the ability or you're not using um, a very high powered, which means expensive blender. Um, the uncertain nutrient, nutrient profile. So dietitians really like to know what is going into someone's body when they're on a feeding tube. And so if you're just making up, you know, blending up whatever you have at home, they don't know that. Uh, caregiver burnout, this is a big one. Um, as much as, you know, we all want to take care of our children and do everything we possibly can, you know, making every single morsel of food for somebody can be a lot and it can be too much when you're caring for somebody. So that's the thing they're concerned about there. And then the cost and time versus opening cans that can be covered by insurance. Um, you know, homemade blending can be expensive. You know, your insurance is not going to cover your grocery bill um, and, and the time involved in that as well. And then lastly here, and, and we still hear this occasionally, that formula is just fine. Why would you want real food if you can't taste it? Um, you know, my argument to that concept is always, you know, I can, I eat a lot of things that don't taste good. I eat kale and broccoli because they're good for me, but, you know, I'd rather just eat donuts. But taste is not the only reason that we put things into our bodies by any means. 
So this is um, kind of the, the first, uh, you know, published study that was done on children with feeding tubes um, on a 100% formula diet and then switched over to a 100% real food diet. Uh, this was done in 2011 uh, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, which has a fantastic um, feeding clinic and, and GI department that, that deals with a lot of kids with feeding tubes with a lot of different complications and they're just, uh, you know, I can't say enough good things about them. So relatively small study, but this really kind of kicked off more research. So um, these children, 52% saw a reported um, 76 to 100% decrease in gagging and retching. It's a big deal. 73% um, were reported to have at least a 50% decrease in symptoms. The parents were highly satisfied, which is fantastic. Um, 57% were reported to have an increased interest in oral intake. And, you know, I don't think that we know necessarily exactly why that is. Is it because they're, you know, something triggered in their body, they were getting real food? Um, or was it because they weren't nauseous, they weren't trying to throw up? And so they, okay, sure, I'd, I'd rather take something orally if I'm not, you know, in the process of trying to keep myself from throwing up. And then lastly here, no child symptoms worsened. So, um, again, this is what kind of kicked off a few different studies and, and you know, really good results. Uh, this was a round table that was published in 2009 of um, different pediatric nurses and dietitians who were just talking about the use of blenderized tube feedings and what they saw um, and, and, you know, all the things that we talked about earlier. So greater volume tolerance, improvements in reflux and constipation, facilitating the transition from tube to oral feedings, um, minimizing the feeding refusal, uh, which is great, and then reduces the gagging, vomiting, and retching. Uh, and this was uh, the last one we've got here is this was actually for adult patients. This was a survey done in 2015 um, from an outpatient GI clinic at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and the survey found that 55% of their home enteral patients were already using blenderized tube feeds. Uh, and 80% were interesting to, interested to do so. So these are adults. We're switching, you know, switching gears here a little bit. These are adults who had, you know, theoretically eaten regular food their whole lives and then um, were placed onto a feeding tube and, and then, you know, the, the, the GI uh, clinic there surveyed them to see what they were actually putting into their feeding tubes. So they asked, you know, why were you why were you putting homemade you know blends into your feeding tube versus the formula? Um, and 43% said it was more natural. 33% said they like eating what their family does. 30% said it was better tolerated. Uh, and 80% of those who were doing this had maintained their body weight, which was the goal for this population. So um, those people reported significantly less vomiting, nausea, bloating, diarrhea, and constipation versus formula. So I'm always happy to talk to an adult tube feeder because they can really tell you a lot of times how things feel and how it felt to be fed, you know, to eat the regular food and then to be formula fed and then to blend re blend regular food. And, and you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, their um, their bodies are much happier with real food. So when you're looking at your enteral nutrition options, um, you know, going back to your child, think about, you know, if your child's placed onto a feeding tube, you know, what, what are you going to do? So you've got really three options. So you've got formula, you've got homemade blending, and now you've got, you know, prepackaged blended food, which is real food blends now that we're going to talk about. So formula is very easy to use, but it's not all natural. There's no variety. Um, you know, you and I don't eat the same thing for every single meal every single day. Um, and, and, you know, there is something to be said for nutritional variety. Uh, it, there's very little risk of contamination, you don't need refrigeration, oftentimes that can be covered by insurance and you don't really need any additional special requirements. Um, and you can see the difference there that, that homemade blending, you know, it, it's, it may be a little bit harder to do because of all the cooking and prepping involved, but it is natural, there is nutritional variety, um, there can be the risk of contamination, again, you know, we're not we're not 100% sure of that. There's obviously a lot of people that can do this at home and keep it clean. Um, but because we're not tasting things first, and taste is really our, our mechanism to keep from eating, you know, bad food, um, there is somewhat of a concern there. Uh, refrigeration is required, and you need to obviously go to the grocery store. There's no insurance coverage for this, and you really do need special equipment, which would mean, um, you know, a Vitamix or a Blendtec, um, you know, high-powered blender. And so Real Food Blends really kind of merges these two worlds. So so the ease of use of formula, the, the potential for insurance coverage of formula, um, you know, the lower risk of contamination, um, but the, the benefits of homemade blend. So it's all natural, still the nutritional variety. You don't need refrigeration, um, and they don't need special equipment, which is um, which is very important. 
So we're going to get, switch gears here and, and talk more about real food blends, um, you know, kind of away from homemade blended diets and, and into real food blends. So these, again, are the meals that um, we created because of our son, uh, who, you know, we I was making food for him because he had done so horribly in commercial formulas. He started doing great on the homemade blends that I made, and then I realized very quickly how much work it was, um, especially if we wanted to leave the house. So that is where the idea for real food blends came from, purely out of need. So the meals now, they are 100% percent real food, shelf-stable me meals pureed to fit through a feeding tube. Uh, it really is that simple. They provide nutritional variety to a real food and real food to a 100% formula diet. Um, you know, these can be used as a convenient option if um, for a blenderized family. So if you're already blending at home, you know, this can be your convenient food option when you're on the go uh, or when you just don't feel like cooking for a day. Uh, and then there's three varieties right now. We have more coming out soon. Uh, they each have a lean protein, a whole grain, fruit, veggie, and a healthy source of fat. So very simple ingredients. So the benefits here, so these 100% real food meals, pre-packaged and shelf-stable, are really as easy as formula. That was the intention, that you could just open it and use it, um, but, you know, you'd still get the benefits of a whole food diet. And so simple ingredients, there's no added sugars or corn syrups, there's no preservatives, there's no artificial colors or flavoring. It's a great source of protein to help support growth and development, and there's a full serving of fruit and vegetables in each one. So, and then you can see Adrian there doing great and, you know, inpatient there using our meals, which is fantastic. Uh, and then using our meals are, um, the meals are ready to feed. So they're a puree. You know, occasionally we get people thinking that it has to be mixed with something or it's a powder. And these are purees that are ready to feed. Uh, they are intended to be bolus fed with a syringe. So, um, and that is because they're thicker than traditional formula. Um, the thickness was intentional, as you can see there, because the thickness tends to help with reflux. So, you know, just think logically, a thicker meal is going to sit better in the stomach and not come up as easily. Um, the other reason for that is that, you know, all of the adults that we talked to, you know, over the two years that we spent in research and development would tell us that um, a thicker meal kind of felt more satisfying, like they had actually eaten a good lunch or a good dinner versus, you know, just kind of having some liquid sloshing around. So the thickness is intentional. Uh, you can thin it out and add some water or formula or milk uh, if it needs, if you need it to go through a gravity bag or a pump. And there's instructions on our website at realfoodblends.com on how to do that. Uh, each pouch is 8 ounces uh, in 330 up to 340 calories. So it's important to note here that these meals can be used in conjunction with commercial formula, um, which is a very different way of looking at, at feeding tube nutrition. You know, most, most of the medical community will just say, okay, here's your feeding tube and then here's your formula and this is what you're supposed to be living off of. Um, it's completely and totally okay to use our meals for dinners and maybe you're using formula the rest of the time or, you know, vice versa. Um, they can be used together and that's totally fine. Um, additionally, they can be used as a base for homemade blending which is, um, you know, can be used to offset the cost of that and, and really to give the, um, the medical community a little more, um, I guess, comfort in what is being served. So they, they know a little bit more about the nutrient profile if they know that you're getting, you know, 70% real food blends. So if you're already on a blenderized diet or doing this at home for your child, um, this can really help simplify the process uh, so you don't need to do as much blending. Um, you know, we always believe that fresh is best, but, you know, fresh isn't always 100% possible. Uh, again, it does give better control of the nutrient profile. Um, for those that are, you know, just thinking about being on a blenderized diet, this is a great way for them to trial it before they invest in a blender and, and all of the time and effort it can take to really do that correctly. Uh, it's convenient obviously and then um, you know lastly here is to ease that financial burden so you know my son is going through so much food these days that it's uh, it, you know it's nice to have an option that um, you know we're not spending so much money on on fresh food constantly for him and then insurance coverage, this is a very important point that um, I'm sure many of you will be interested in. So uh, there, our meals are covered by most insurance plans. It's, it's covered under this, what's called a HICPIC code, and that's B4149. Um, it's something that you would need to talk to your home health care company about. Um, or your dietitian, but we also have an insurance advocate can, that can help you here. So private insurers and Medicaid and Medicare have both paid under this code. Uh, it's not a super specialized code. It's kind of a middle of the road one. And so sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes it takes a little bit more um, effort, but you know, usually it can be done. Um, like we say here, that realfoodblends.com slash insurance has a lot more information on this. 
And then if you're if you're interested in you know blenderized diets uh, and, and maybe doing it at home or just more information um, as you're learning about you know what exactly this is and how to do it, um, there are a bunch of Facebook groups that are really rich and experienced per, uh, parents um, and adults um, for homemade blending and finding supportive medical professionals. It's very important. You know, I don't ever want to send somebody to you know Dr. Google quote unquote, but it really can be um, so nice to talk to other people who are in the same boat. Um, I have to so you can't just walk into your local Starbucks and ask around if anybody knows anybody with a feeding tube. But um, you know, luckily the power of the internet has has really connected a lot of us. And then the two books that are listed here, both Complete Tube Feeding and um, the Homemade Blenderized Diet Handbook, are fantastic resources as well. And they should both be available on Amazon. Um, and lastly, again, always consult with your medical team before making any dietary changes. Um, you know, especially when it's somebody who's medically fragile. So, uh, if you have any questions, I am available. Really, the best place to uh, to reach me is just to send an email to info at realfoodblends.com. Uh, more than happy to ask any or answer any questions. Um, we do have our meals available on our website as well at realfoodblends.com. Um, if you want to trial them, so you can you can purchase out of pocket and and see how it goes before you go down the insurance path as well. So, uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, to be here today. We really appreciate it. And um, please contact me at info at realfoodblends.com. Give any questions.